Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening once again, and I am Grimnir here to bring you the Grim Leftovers. All the stories I didn't get to on the Freaker's Ball over the past several weeks. Anyway, it is Monday, August the 12th, 2019. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I had just saw something in the chat, made me chuckle there. Uh, anyway, oh, <laughs> oh boy, uh, uh, welcome everybody to the show. Uh, glad that you're back here with me on uh, this Monday evening. Right here in sunny New Mexico, and it is sunny out there. It's sunny, it's warm, it's 88 degrees out there right now, 24% humidity, a mere 10, uh, 10, 13 miles per hour uh, winds. Yes, indeed. Summer day, that's the way it goes in uh, mid-August, and that's where we're at. We're in mid-August already, imagine that. Anyway, so uh, welcome to all the folks out there in all the various places you may be tuned in from, whether that's right here on reallibertymedia.com on the, the Grim Leftovers show page or just using the sidebar player or maybe you're over there on rlmradio.xyz it's possible you tuned in through the direct stream using one of your local uh, audio players whether it's like VLC or something else and a lot of people use a lot of various other things uh, uh, or maybe you're tuned in from freedomsnetwork.com how do you do Freedoms Network people? Maybe you're tuned in from realliberty.org, a little social, another little social networking site that's partnered uh, with reallibertymedia.com. Uh, maybe you saw the tweet over there on Twitter or the post on minds.com. I don't know. You could be anywhere. Maybe you're on TuneIn. Hey, TuneIn folks, <laughs> or internet radio. Anyway, to all y'all out there, welcome to the show. Uh, we have, I, uh, we, we, just me, I have many stories lined up here for you as I do on these Monday evenings. And, uh, first off though, I want to say hi and howdy to all the folks that are out there, uh, whether you're here in the chat or not, but if you are here in the chat, let me run down some of the names of the people that are here this evening, uh, and say hi. We got the bar man. Yes. He's my favorite bot. My, well, my favorite, he's my, my bot, the oldest bot, the bot I wrote from scratch, uh, and he does all kinds of fun stuff for us here in the chat room. We got Mr. Beetle, who's on the move once again. Myself and the Moose Girl are in the list as well. We got Mr. DC from down there in Tejas. I, I don't know who 94KAAGY6R is. That's a new one to me. But howdy, uh, Mr. Random Number Letter person. <laughs> but I think it's somebody we know because they're up there in the plus zone. So we got Anti and Asmo and Chalcedony, the Miss Gramsci, the wonderful Miss Gramsci. Now, if you had not heard, uh, August 30th will be Gramsci's final show, at least for a while. I don't know how long that while is going to be or if there'll be a return after that. Uh, I remember myself going on hiatus from a program I used to do on a daily basis, the RLM News Show, and I never re restarted that. The only reason I'm doing this show pretty much is people say, hey, we want some more RLM News type stuff. Yeah, well, you know, you're not getting the, the daily RLM News, but you're getting this on a Monday night, so uh, that's, you know, whatever, something. We got the Java Doctor and Mr. Meester Meister Brow, a.k.a. Wood Man, the wonderful Miss Kate in her fancy, shiny new bathroom. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rob Works, who's actually out to dinner at the moment. Uh, Mr. Romes, the Vanna Whitepot. Vin E. Verbolton. Yes, he is Verbolton. Uh, we got the Weather Dork Pot and Prince in brackets today, for whatever reason. Uh, the Phantom, uh, Cyborg Noodle, and the Civ. Oh, man, we got all kinds of people here tonight. We got a couple of frumpies. We got the Goob, Goober, Zilla, the Zilla. We, some people call him Goob, some people call him Zilla, you know, whatever. Uh, we got Gromit and Hagrid, Hagrid, a.k.a. Mike. Uh, and, huh? <laughs> JJ's from over there in Scotland. Uh, 
Yes, indeed. Uh, I like Mr. JJ's. He's, he's, a, he's a cool guy. Uh, we got Kiss and Mr. Snick. I don't know Mr. Snick. I've seen him chatting around in here in the past few days, but I, I don't know who he is. So howdy, Mr. Snick. Welcome to the show. We got the Pwn Sauce and a Sock a Puppet, who uh, did Kate's shiny brand new bathroom there. So we got all these folks here hanging out in the chat. We got other folks from other countries tuned in on the stream that are not here in the chat. So welcome to you all as well. We won't mention any names of any people that we possibly believe are out there, but you know who you are and we miss you. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, let's get this going. I got all kinds of stuff, like I said, lined up here for you and ready to go. Uh, and we're going to start off with an article from Reason.com that was posted over there on July 9th of this year, just a little over a month ago. And here it is. An Iowa man wins his free speech lawsuit after being charged for a Facebook rant against a cop. So he went on to Facebook and said something that the cop didn't like, and the cop sued his ass. John Goldsmith was charged with third-degree harassment after calling Deputy Corsi, Corey Dorsey, Corsi Dorsey, Corey Dorsey, a stupid some bitch online. You stupid some bitch. Anyway, uh, Goldsmith of Red Oak, Iowa, was charged with third-degree harassment after calling Adams County Sheriff Deputy Corey Dorsey, among other things, a stupid some bitch on Facebook. Nearly a year after the inc incident, Goldsmith has won his free speech lawsuit against the sheriff's office. As a reason previously reported, according to the lawsuit, John Goldsmith of Red Oak witnessed Adams County Sheriff Deputy Corey Dorsey stop a motorist and conduct a drug dog search on a vehicle. At a festival in July of 2018, no drugs were found. Goldsmith also said he saw Dorsey body slam another man. When Goldsmith later saw the man's mugshot on Facebook, he shared the picture in a cri and criticizing Dorsey. Goldsmith called Dorsey out by name and accused him of being butthurt. Uh, that uh, drug search was fruitless. He also called him a stupid son bitch and offered to hire Dorsey to walk a, or to walk his dog and pick up his shit if he were fired over the incident. A few weeks later, Goldsmith was accused of writing a threatening and vulgar statement about Corey Dorsey on Facebook. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, I think that's the pretty much the uh, definition of butthurt. Uh, Sergeant Paul Hogan, D Dorsey supervisor, had filed charges of third-degree harassment against Goldsmith on behalf of his subordinate. The charges were short-lived after Goldsmith's attorney managed to get them dropped for violating the First Amendment. A year later, the ACLU filed suit on his behalf against the county, Dorsey, and Hogan in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Iowa. Goldsmith won his case, according to a Monday press release. Uh, the Adams County Sheriff uh, Office will pay Goldsmith $10,000 in damages from stolen tax, stolen money from what they call taxpayers, but uh, uh, theft victims, I would say, is, is more accurate. Anyway, so they'll pay Goldsmith $10,000 in damages, which includes the cost of the lawyer he hired to defend himself in court. A judge also ordered the deputies to stop charging civilians for criticizing its law enforcement, as they've done at least two other times. Officers will be receiving an ACLU-approved training on free speech and implementing an ACLU-approved social media policy. <laughs> as the court's injunction uh, today confirms, people... You and I have a constitutional free speech right to criticize their government. Police are not allowed to charge people with crimes because they annoy the police or say things the police disagree with on social media like Facebook or otherwise. There is no exception because someone expresses anger 
in an inartful way. I thought it was very, very artful. But, uh, you know, art is a matter, is, is uh, in the eye of the beholder, so whatever. Anyway, causes offense or uses curse words, said Rita uh, Bettis Austin of the ACLU of Iowa's legal director. Yeah, you know, the butt hurt cop. Ooh, ooh, he insulted me, and, and I, I just wanted to harass somebody and, and get them for drugs that they didn't have and do illegal searches that, oh, yeah. Screw you, pig. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> this, this next story I find deeply disturbing. Maybe some people think it's good. I don't know. But I find it disturbing. And here it is. From KOAT.com. KOAT7 Action News out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. First baby in the United States born from deceased donor's transplanted womb. Eh. Cleveland Clinic official said they have delivered the first baby in North America after a womb transplant from a deceased donor. Uterine transplants have enabled more than a dozen women to give birth, usually with wombs donated from a living donor, such as a friend or relative. In December, doctors in Brazil report reported the world's first birth using deceased donor's womb. These transplants were pioneered by a Swedish doctor who did the first successful one five years ago. Uh, the Cleveland Hospital said Tuesday the girl was born in June. Apparently she's an actual human, a living human. She's not a zombie, as you might expect. Although she may have some zombie-like qualities. We'll have to wait and see until, until she starts growing up, gets beyond her infant stage, and see if she's got any zombie-type qualities, but... Uh, it's a it's a, a dead person's womb transplanted into a live woman, and they're able to... Ah! Anyway, it was amazing how perfectly normal the delivery was, considering how extraordinary the occasion, said Dr. Andreas Zakis, Cleveland Clinic transplant surgeon, in a prepared statement. Uh, Through this research, we aim to make these extraordinary events ordinary, for women who choose this option. We are grateful to the donor and her family for their generosity, uh, allowing the patient's dream to come true and a new baby to be born. The uterus was transplanted in, to the mother in late 2017, and the woman became pregnant through in vitro fertilization in 2018. The clinic has done five uterus transplants so far, and three have been successful with two women waiting to attempt pregnancy in the next with the new wombs. Uh, in, in all, the clinicians aim to enroll 10 women in its study. Uh, now, you women out there, you women out there, <laughs> would you take, <laughs> would you take a womb from a dead woman? <laughs> I'm just wondering. I, I mean, I understand that they do liver transplants, kidney transplants, heart transplants, eyeball transplants from dead people all the time. I get that. But a womb, which is there to produce a new life from a dead person, eh, I don't know, seems seems a little skeevy. See, it seems wrong. I, 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 I don't like it. <laughs> I, I I think there's, you know, the, we have to wait for you know several years to find out what's going to happen with this baby, a, a a baby from a dead from a dead womb. I I don't know. I don't know. Seems weird. Seems wrong to me. Maybe it's not. Yeah. All right. Zerohedge.com, July thirteen, two thousand nineteen. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, pours over old scientific papers, makes discoveries overlooked by humans. Now, are these humans not reading 
efficiently, correctly? How can you look over somebody's paper? How can you read through, study some paper and miss things that an AI could find? I don't know. Anyway, when AI isn't busy taking our jobs, it's making brand new scientific discoveries that our clunky human brains somehow overlooked. Clunky human brains. <laughs> Research. Now, you're, those clunky human brains created the AI in the first place, you know. Um, <laughs> all right. Researchers from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab trained in AI called Word2VEC on scientific papers to see if there was any latent knowledge that humans were not able to grok on its first pass. Grok, yeah, you remember that word, right? The study published by Nature on July 3rd reveals that the algorithm found predictions for potential thermoelectric materials which can convert heat into energy for various heating and cooling applications. Okay. The algorithm did not know the definition of thermoelectric, though. It received no training on the material science. Using only word associations, the algorithm was able to provide candidates for future thermoelectric materials some of which may be better than those we currently use. So this AI starts reading this document. The AI doesn't even know the meaning of the word thermoelectric, and yet it comes up with things that a human brain can't make up or come up with. I find this... I, 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 anyway, it can read any paper on material science, so it can make connections that no scientist could, said a researcher, somebody's name I can't pronounce. Sometimes it does what a researcher would do. Other times it makes the cross-discipline associations. The algorithm was designed to assess the language in 3.3 million abstracts from material sciences uh, and was able to build a vocabulary, learning machine, around a half a million words. Word to VEC used machine learning to analyze relationships between words. The way that this word to VEC algorithm works is that you train a neural network model to remove each word and predict what the words next to it will be, according to Jane, the one of the developers there, adding that by training a neural network on a word, you get representations of words that can actually confer knowledge, which is kind of creepy. Uh, anyway, using just the words found in the scientific abstracts, the algorithm was able to understand concepts such as the periodic table and the chemical structure of molecules. The algorithm linked words uh, that were found close together, creating vectors of related words that helped define concepts. In some cases, words were linked to thermoelectric concepts, but had never been written about as thermoelectric in any abstract they surveyed. This gap in knowledge is hard to catch with a human eye, but easy for an algorithm to spot. After showing its capacity to pre predict future materials, researchers took their work back in time, virtually. They scraped recent data and tested the algorithm on old papers, seeing if it could predict the scientific discoveries before they happened. Once again, the algorithm worked. As one example, researchers fed publications from before 2009 into the algorithm and were able to predict one of the first, uh, one of the most effective modern day thermoelectric materials four years before it was actually discovered in 2012. The technology is not restricted to material science either, as it can be trained on a wide variety of disciplines by retraining it on literature from whichever subject for which one uh, for which one wants to provide a deeper analysis. 
The algorithm is unsupervised and builds its own connections, said the study's lead author, Vahe's something or the other, uh, adding that you could use this for things like medical research or drug discovery. The information is out there. We just haven't made these connections yet because you can't read every article. Which is true. You can't read every article. That would be that would be impossible <laughs> for the best of humans, but a computer could. Um, yeah, because it can read at, at light speed and you have to read at human speed. Um, but but I, I find this, I don't know, this is, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, get it, getting towards the singularity. I, I think that's what's going on here. Uh, closing in on the singularity. And while that, those algorithms for doing that particular research may be good, what about this one? Posted over here on TheVerge.com on July 10th. Why does everyone get so worked up over Gmail's smart reply feature? Now, I have a different question to ask, which is, why is anybody using Gmail? Get the hell off of Gmail. Come on. What are you What are you doing? You know Google scans every single le letter of every email you send and or receive. You really want that? You really want Google having that kind of access to your personal correspondence? I don't think you do. I think that's a, a, a bad choice. There's a lot of other choices out there for email, free emails that that you can use and, and people are still using Gmail. I just don't get it. But you know, that's me. All right, here we go. <laughs> Caitlin Tiffany and I, who wrote this here? Uh, Ashley Carmen. So Caitlin Tiffley, Tif Tiffany and Ashley Carmen avoided talking about email as long as we could, but it's the fourth season of our podcast, so it's time. They have seasons of podcasts? I thought podcasts were just like never ending. Yeah, that's how they work here on RLM. Except for Vinny. Vinny does seasons. <laughs> so easily he does them. This week on Why'd You Push That Button, we ask why are people so worked over over worked up over Gmail's smart reply feature? Smart replies are suggestions that Google makes through artificial intelligence when someone begins replying to an email. So you go in there and you, you get an email from a friend of yours talking about let's go to the lake or whatever. Uh, and you, say, you start typing something in there and Google suggests words for you to use talking to your friend. Do you want somebody, do you want some algorithm speaking for you do you want other people inserting words into your brain into your thought processes i don't but that's me again that's again that's me so yeah um so smart uh, smart replies are suggestions that google makes through ai when someone begins replying to an email it's similar to S smart compose which makes suggestions as you type. People have, have strong feelings about both these features. Uh, we interview Verge Deputy Editor Liz Lapato about her smart reply feelings and how, perhaps, they aren't so bad. Then we chat with writer Sarah Hagi about how she only uses smart reply in highly specific situations. <sighs> Finally, we talk to Naomi Barron professor of linguistics emerita at American University and author of Wor Words on Screen, The Fate of Reading in a Digital World. She walks us through the history of pre-written messages and how we all need to relax. No, you don't. You need to get that. You need to get the hell off that stuff. <laughs> anyway, like I said, my personal opinion, do what you like. You know, it's your, it's your life. It's if you want somebody injecting thoughts into your brain, into your thought process, uh, 
Go for it. I don't want that at all. Email and language will persevere, even if Google's AI writes all of our boring responses. Eh. Anyway, the, the podcast is here, posted into this thing here, um, uh, that these th- these two gals... Uh, wait, is that, is that gender assuming? Should I consider them gals, even though they're... Their names are Caitlin and Ashley. <laughs> You'll have to decide. I, I, to me, I want, I want no part of that. I want... No, Google and Gmail are not your friend, Vinny. They are not your friend. <laughs> they... Oh, yeah. They're, they're one of the... They're, they're friends of you like... Uh, the worst spy you could imagine, buddying up to you, pretending to be your friend, meanwhile digging, 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 uh, trying to get all the information about you it possibly can. Oh, yes, and uh, to bring it back and throw it in your face at the worst possible time, you, Google, Gmail, not your friend, not your friend. Um, And let me give you this here, although this list is not that great, um, I, I'll give it to you anyway because it, it's it's decent enough to get you to some degree, some uh, some way down the road on a way f- to get you away from the Google at least on the search engine. And let me just say this about the search engine: whether it's Google or Yahoo or Bing or uh, one of the other free uh, non non monitoring ones like the ones I use. Um, I pretty much use DuckDuckGo. Sometimes, some, sometimes I'll, I'll use Start Page, but pretty much DuckDuckGo. Uh, anyway, um, let me just say something about the, the the search suggestions that they that pop up if you have it set that way to do, and most people do. Uh, I think it's a default setting, but it, those search suggestions can take you down a bad road as well. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, it's not just the email doing their smart replies that are that are that are steering you wrong, but uh, these search suggestions certainly do as well. Anyway, here it is from CollectiveEvolution.com: uh, a complete list of alternatives to the Google search engine. And I, I will tell, and this was posted July seventh. And I will tell you, this is not a complete list. It's an okay list, but not all of the things they have work actually. Anyway, they they tell you in brief here, the facts, using Google as a search engine is no longer giving you access to unedited truth, as admitted by Google exec Jean Jean Genai. As you will see, Google what Google wants you to see. You won't get to see if you type into Google. Alternative medicines. You're not going to get alternative medicines. You're going to get articles about why alternative medicines are no good. Why they are shams and charlatans. You don't want to use natural cures. Those are bad, according to Google. According to the results you're going to get from a Google search. We are living in a very interesting time. One in where we have a ministry of truth. That is quite Orwellian. The ministry, well, yeah, it comes from 1984, so yeah. Anyway, the Ministry of Truth is uh, deciding what's real and what's not for people. And they hold a tremendous amount of power and resources. Google is part of this ministry, a large part. And they are playing their part in censoring, demonetizing, and hiding information and platforms that does not suit the agenda. The plan that does not fit the plan. If you remember the uh, the album by a band called Rush called Twenty One Twelve, and the, and the guy one this one guy goes out into the forest and he finds this old guitar laying there by a stream bed and he picks it up and he starts plucking it and it's making music and he starts wow ooh, this is great and he takes it up to the to the the priests there uh, the the ones that control everything they're basically they're they're the Ministry of Truth, the the controllers of society. He says, check this out, Waka, because there's no music at that point. 
2112 in in the storyline of that of that album <laughs> and the priest of Syrinx up there they say don't don't annoy us further your 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 music does not fit the plan get out of here with that stuff if we wanted people to have music we'd let them have music yep but well, we don't want them to have music music's bad <laughs> Anyway, one of the most in recent examples this guy wrote about was with regards to one of the top natural health uh, health awareness websites in the world, Mercola.com. I love Mercola.com. Lots of great information on there. They, like many others, including the collective evolution, have been censored by Google, as well as other social media platforms, for simply sharing information. No matter how solid the evidence or the sources are, it's simply being censored because of what the information implies and because of the consequences it may have for those in power and whose powerful interests in, in th that information may threaten. By the way, in case you were unaware, Google has recently partnered with, take uh, invested in, um, become stockholders of a couple large pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies. So when you kind of think, well, why would they block Mercola? Why would they block uh, other natural health sites? They, it, doesn't, it doesn't benefit them. It doesn't profit them. They don't want you to know that information. Have we really gotten to the point where simple information can be censored just because it is threatening to them? Why do we have to have global elitists determining what is real and what is fake for the population? Is the population not capable of doing this on their own? Eh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I'm not going to pass judgment on that question. Uh, who, this is the big question, who are these fact checkers? If we look at fake news watchdog NewsGuard, it provides some insight on who is behind this type of thing. They claim to hold independent media outlets accountable for their stories. They are funded by Clinton donors and Big Pharma with ties to the Council on Foreign Relations. There you get break it get get on down to the core there. They are one of many who have clear agenda in favor of mainstream establishment media, a.k.a. the clap, and some powerful interests. This comes at the same time that multiple award-winning mainstream media journalists and declassified documents are exposing that mainstream media outlets are paid by and run by corporations, governments, and intelligence agencies. You can see a few examples in this article, as well as links to some interesting documents. It goes into greater detail on the subject. The truth is, for years, the human population, especially in the West, has been deliberately manipulated. Our thoughts, ideas, and perceptions with regards to certain areas like geopolitics is, for the lack of a better word, literally programmed into us. Now, that's what I'm telling you about those smart replies. It's not just replying to somebody. It's programming you to think in a certain way. You don't want smart replies. Uh, I don't want smart replies. You may want them. I don't know. To me, it's, it's absolute insanity that anybody would uh, accept that type of thing. And uh, just Gmail in general. Oh, just uh. Anyway, many of us and most of us for a very long time never really thought for ourselves. We kind of been in zombie mode, you could say. For the past few years, though, uh, this clearly changed and more and more people have been questioning what the hell is really going on behind the scenes. This was a result of massive amounts of information that leaked out in the form of credible journalism, whatever that word means, from various independent media outlets. Uh, there are many deliberate manipulation of the opinions of the masses 
and that those who manipulate this unseen mechanism constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of the global geopolitics. Our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, and our, de our ideas are suggested largely by men that we have never heard of. Quote from Edward Bernays there. So anyway, alternatives to Google and why. All this said, when you search for things on Google, you will see that Google wants you to see and it will shape the narrative by which you see your world. It will also push you to search for certain things over others. Here's a great example. When you type in, say, vaccine cause A, nowhere in the list do you see autism even though that is one of the most searched terms on the subject. Instead, you see a very different list, like vac vaccines cause adults, vaccines, and vaccines cause allergies, uh, adults meaning ADHD, uh, which is interesting that they would even allow vaccines cause ADHD in there, um, Trudeau, uh, autoimmune disease, anxiety, but no autism in the list. Another great example would be anyone trying to search about Hillary Clinton email scandal. If you type in Hillary Clinton email, you get no suggestions whatsoever. But if you tested that against Donald Trump email, you get normal suggestions. Donald Trump contact email, Donald Trump's email, Donald Trump junior email, Donald Trump personal email, business email, email sign up newsletters, crap like that. As per admission from Google's executive, Jen Jenai, this is because Google is trying, trying to draw a line in the sand and tell people how to think right, how to get your mind right, and what's wrong in our world. You can learn about more about her from uh, her statements. There's a link here to Jen Jenai. Uh, the, the day we shut down, or our, our shut down from questioning, and forced into measures and information against our own will is the day everybody should know something is very, very wrong. Being a researcher myself, the amount Google has changed over the past 10 years is pretty crazy, and it's no longer a useful, neutral search engine, as many sources of information have been completely blocked by their algorithms. Here at The Collective Evolution, we don't use Google anymore for pretty well any of our searches. We are also in the process of moving away from other Google products uh, that says they still use Gmail. Currently, most of us use DuckDuckGo here at CE. And here's a list of a great list of alternatives you can try instead of Google to compare search topics and see what comes up compared to the Google. Uh, they give you a list of 10 here. A start page. Seer X, which I think I tried and I didn't like for some reason. Metagur, which I, is a German German thing, which didn't really work well for me. Swiss Cows, uh, zero tracking search engine based in Switzerland. Quant, which is a French one. DuckDuckGo. Uh, Mojik, the only true search engine, they say, that has its own crawler and index. Uh, Mojik, that is, uh, Y-A-C-Y, a decentralized open source peer-to-peer -peer search engine. You could build your own search engine from, from that from that right there. Um, Gavero is Denmark. Ecosia, which is a German one, um, and supposedly uh, nice to the planet. Anyway, uh, the, the thing is here, uh, at the end of the day, truth in all areas that surround humanity cannot be stopped. The simple fact that they, quote unquote, they had to deplatform, demonetize, and censor various media outlets around the globe, all except for the small handful of mainstream corporate establishment media outlets, the clap, simply exposed even more of what's really going on. As much as this uh, seems rough, this is inspiring. The global elitists, the people that call themselves elite, believe themselves to be elite, 
are losing so much power that their desperation is kicking in. And just because works of fiction might suggest that sometimes the bad guys win does not mean it's going to happen here and now. In fact, I know you can feel that we are going to make it through a big shift here. I'm not positive, but I'm hopeful. Uh, and acts like this further reveal the truth to people. Keep on thinking for yourself. That's the key right there. Keep on thinking for yourself. And connecting with who you truly are. It is the way forward. So... Thank you, Collective Evolution, and the authors there for that piece. Uh, I, I, there's a, like I said, there's a bunch of links and such in there. You might want to pull that article up, uh, either either from uh, the the post show blog or um, right there from the link I posted in the chat. So uh, you take a look. You you make your own mind up there on that. It's it's up to you. All right, where are we at here? Okay, forty. All right. Um. How many of you out there, how many of y'all use Android? And I'm going to say this article is specifically about Android, but I'm sure it applies to Apple products as well. Uh, Apple phones, iPhones, whatever you call them, and, and others, other types. Uh, but just bear in mind, this is the case and this is true. From RT.com, Russia Today, on July 8th, 2019. Uh, over 1,000 Android apps harvest your data even if you deny permission. They're out there. They're stealing your data. Researchers have found that more than 1,000 Android apps, probably way more than 1,000, that skirt around data protection restrictions that protect consumer privacy, collecting data even when you deny permissions to the app to access their information. If app developers can just circumvent the system, then asking consumers for permission means nothing. According to Serge, uh, Serge Eggelman, Director of Usability Security and Privacy Research at UC Berkeley's International Computer Science Institute, which he produced the research. The findings were presented at PrivacyCon, a conference hosted by the U.S. FTC in late June. The study's sample contained some 88,000 apps from the Google Play Store. Our researchers then investigated their data transfer process. The user denied them permission to access data. They found that 1,325 of them used workarounds to circumvent the denial in order to collect data from sources across the phone software. One of the apps mentioned uh, by name was Shutterfly, which is used for editing photos. The study found that it gathers GPS coordinates of where photos were taken and then sends the information to its own servers. Regardless of whether users allowed or declined the app permission across their locate to access their location. Like many photo services, Shutterfly uses this data to enhance the user experience with features such as categorization and personalized product suggestions, all in accordance with Shutterfly's privacy policy or lack of privacy policy as, it, as, it, as well as the Android developer agreement. A Shutterfly spokesman said in a statement, responding to the study. Some, app, some apps were found to have not violated privacy settings themselves, but rather utilized piggybacking to obtain data from other apps that the user did allow access to. Examples of this include Baidu's Hong Kong Disneyland app. Uh, it seems like an obscure thing, but maybe in Hong Kong it's huge. I don't know. Uh, it's not the first time that questions have been raised about the tech giant's commitment to protecting, protecting user privacy. Last year, AP reported that Google had been continuing to store user location data, even in cases where users had turned off location history feature. There's your friend, Vinny. Google, 
continuing to store your user location data even when you told them not to. Eggleman will presenting, be presenting more detailed information about the research findings at the Usenix Security Conference in August, according to the online technologic, technology publication CNET. Which CNET is sometimes okay for information, sometimes not. Yeah, I don't have a smartphone either there, Hagrid, but, uh, you know, <laughs> most people do. You're, you're, we're kind of outcasts uh, in this society by not having smartphones. We're, we're, we're definitely on the margins without, without, without those devices in hand. <laughs> Sorry, I need a sip there. Alrighty then. Posted on July 11th, 2019 on Summit News, Summit.News by Paul Joseph Watson. New Finnish study finds no evidence. No evidence. Zero evidence. Total lack of evidence for man-made climate change. Dang, there goes the consensus. <laughs> A new study by researchers at Turku University in Finland found that human contribution to the a rise of 0.1 degrees C in global temperatures over the last century is just 0.1 degrees C. Huh. The paper titled, No Experimental Evidence for the Significant Anthropogenic Climate Change was published uh, by people's names I can't pronounce because they're Finnish. And I don't speak Finnish and I, I have trouble with these kind of words. The study found that during the last 100 years, the temperature uh, is increased about 0.1 degrees C because of carbon dioxide, which I'm going to disagree with. Carbon dioxide does not cause an increase in temperature. The human contribution was about 0.01 C. I think I missed, I mean, I think I missed a zero when I mentioned that earlier. So 0.01 C, uh, uh, so a tenth of the other number, which nothing, nothing. Com these people's names uh, conclude that the global temperatures are controlled primarily by cloud cover that only a small small part of the increased carbon dioxide concentration is anthropogenic. The study also calls into question the claims of the UN IPCC which concluded that global temperatures are largely driven by human activity course we know the IPCC and Michael Mann are liars liars manipulators fakers of data yes look up climate gate if you don't believe me research climate gate just a little bit but not on Google <laughs> don't try and look for it on Google that does not fit the plan anyway while the methods <laughs> and results of the study can be debated. This once again illustrates how there is no zero overwhelming consensus on man-made global warming as the media often claims. In reality, there are dozens, hundreds probably, of prominent scientists who believe that climate change is driven by natural forces? What? That this cyclic thing is cyclic? <laughs> or maybe it's just that the United Nations climate predictions are lies and unreliable. <laughs> yes, it's all fake. It's all phony. And it's done that so that they can at first guilt you into thinking that your existence on this planet is a horrible, terrible, bad thing. And secondly, once they've got you guilted into that belief, then they can control you and tax you and, and, and remove all personal property, which is really one of their primary goals is 
putting a total end to personal property. That that is absolutely what they want to do. All right, this is a big story to me. Maybe not that big of a story. Maybe you already know this, but the fact that it's posted on Bloomberg, kind of when I when I first saw this, I was like, "Wow, really?" But here it is, and, and it's on Bloomberg, so you're not gonna get the the deep dirt. <laughs> that you might want to get. <laughs> but here it is, and this was posted on... Uh, da, 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 do they have a date in here somewhere? Um, no. They, oh, wait, there it is. July 2nd. Okay. The British banking dynasty that's even older than the Rothschilds. C. Whore and Company, that's H-O-A-R-E, in case you're wondering. Whore. C. Hoare and Company has been in business for more than 300 years and the family that founded it is still running the show. The London firm was started in 1672 by Richard Hoare and has attended the affairs of the diarist Samuel Peps, 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 I guess, uh, poet Lord Byron and novelist Jane Austen. That's almost a hundred years older than the famous Rothschild dynasty, which was founded in the 1760s. So after more than three centuries of continuous operation, the family still runs the show, overseeing about 4.4 billion pounds, uh, you can bet it's more than that, and deposits and sticking to a traditional way of doing business. You go in and talk, said Easley Robinson, chief executive officer of Ennis, a mortgage broker, with dozens of high net worth clients who have borrowed from the bank. They lend their own money and tend to be able to come up with solutions that other banks cannot. The last of the tenth generation of partners retired last year, leaving the banks in the hands of six partners from the eleventh generation who have continued its evolution. In March, they opened the first outpost outside London, a Cambridge office, designed to serve existing clients, but also attract entrepreneurs in a region known for bioscience and technology ventures. Blending old with new has become vital for Seahor rival courts and smaller com competitors such as Raphael's and Weathersby's, Weatherby's, as they vie to serve wealthy clients, independent banks are also striving to recon reconcile their highly tailored services to an industry where prevailing trends are consol consolidating and rising regulations. It's a constant tension because part of what makes us completely different to the clearing banks is that we are smaller and more personable uh, more human and more relatable to customers. Seahor is certainly different. This firm is an unlimited liability partnership instead of a limited liability, uh, meaning that the personal assets of the partners are fair game for creditors. Since at least 1994, the dividend has been fixed at £50 per share of £6,000. That's for the business of £26 million of profit and 12 months through March of 2019. Anyway, I, I just thought you might want to know about this Seahor company um, and the fact that they are older and they are part of the whole game that we're... That is our enemy. <laughs> and I say our, as in um, being people, not everybody, but people that that understand the bankers are not there for your to do you any favors. To do you any good, uh, the, these are part of those that believe them to themselves to be these global elitists. Anyway, the article is fairly lengthy, and, and you may want to go through it and and read read through it, and and see all the information that's involved there. Um, by the way, if you have trouble getting into Bloomberg, uh, just go into your browser settings and and block cookies for that site, and you'll be able to read all the Bloomberg stuff you want. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, here we go from July 11th off of the website moonofalabama.com. Oh, I know. Yeah, absolutely. It's a family bank. Uh, that, yeah, that, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting coat of arms. Exactly. All right. So here we go. Moon of Alabama. Iran keeps calm while the United States and Britain continue their provocations. And this is a month old, uh, but it, it's still relevant because the United States and Britain and, well, and Israel, by the way, and Saudi Arabia are continuing provocations. Yep. Isley Robinson, is that uh, the author here? I don't know. All right. <laughs> Great Britain has joined the U.S. pressure and provocation campaign against Iran. It is creating incidents to put Iran into a defensive position and to provoke in, provoke them into a violent reaction. Earlier that day, two U.S. officials spread a scare story about Iran, which led to this CNN headline, Iranian boats attempt to seize British tanker in Strait of Hormuz. Armed Iranian boats unsuccessfully tried to seize a British tanker in the Persian Gulf on Wednesday, according to two U.S. officials who will not be named, with direct knowledge of the incident. The British heritage tanker was sailing out of the Persian Gulf and was crossing into the Strait of Hormuz when it was approached by boats. (laughs) Yeah, not not gunboats as they'd have you believe. (laughs) Little speed boats, rafts. Uh, the, the Iranians ordered the tanker to change course and stop in nearby Iranian territorial waters, according to the officials. The same two unnamed U.S. officials briefed ABC News. A British warship prevented an apparent attempt by five Iranian small boats to direct a British oil tanker towards Iranian waters on Wednesday. But it was already in Iranian waters. Anyway... Uh, just bear in mind that this is this is this is going on, and it's obviously not just this one story. Uh, if you pay attention at all, um, they they keep on pounding this information, telling you about this story, uh, or stories that try to paint Iran as this terrible, horrible bad guy doing nasty, terrible, bad things. Don't believe a word of it. They, it's lies. It's propaganda. And the United States government pushed out a law several years back during the Obama era that, yes, the, the, the media, the mainstream clap media, is allowed to push out propaganda, government-approved propaganda. They're actually kind of, they walk hand in hand. So, yes, in order to achieve whatever agenda... Your government wants to achieve. All right, and finally, from uh, the f- J- July fifteenth here on SputnikNews.com, Facebook could be fined one million dollars a day. You do your your best Doctor Evil impression there. One million dollars. I can't do it. Anyway. $1 million a day if it launches Libra cryptocurrency project. Yes, Facebook, which is expected to pay $5 billion in fines for violating privacy rules, is going to launch a new cryptocurrency. Not a real cryptocurrency, not a decentralized cryptocurrency. Uh, no, no, not nothing <laughs> even close to that. Supported by big tech companies and backed by fiat currencies. The offer is uh, has raised serious concern among lawmakers over how it will be governed because, you know, they must govern, govern everything. The Democratic majority on the House Financial Services Committee drafted a proposal to prevent big tech from operating as a financial institution or issuing their own cryptocurrencies. 
a move that increases pressure on Facebook's proposed digital coin, Libra. As reported by Reuters, tech companies with annual global revenues of more than $25 billion violating such rules would face a fine of a million dollars per day. And I'll just say on that, it's not a crypto, not a cryptocurrency as you've come to know cryptocurrencies. It may, they may use a blockchain to do it, but they don't, it will not be a mined cryptocurrency where you can go and mine it. It won't be a limited cryptocurrency uh, where there's only certain amount ever created ever and it's specified up front ahead of time. No, this will be a fiat cryptocurrency that can be added to indefinitely and forever to make it as many as they want, just like with your phony Federal Reserve debt notes. All right, I am out of and over my time here on Grim Leftovers, so thank you all for tuning in, everybody and anybody that has tuned in this evening. I will be back again next Monday with episode 35. And um, coming up in about six hours right here on RLM Radio is the Flash Flash Somebody doing his show in a perfect world. And check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all of the rest of the shows throughout the week. Have yourselves a great week, by the way. We'll talk to you all later. Peace!